the deep breath. Pull it out slow. Take another deep breath. And slowly release anything that no longer serves you. As we settle into this sacred moment, this moment of oneness, this moment of holy matrimony on this sacred ground. The ma matrimony of male and female. The lock and the key. That is within each and every one of us. And we bring our attention to The male, the father, the giver. The giver of all good, the giver of the light. The giver of the wisdom, the giver of peace, of joy. For it is our Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And we rejoice and be glad. So we celebrate that kingdom within and as that spirit of fatherhood that has filled us with so much joy in life. We allow it to spill over, spill over and touch everyone that we come in contact with. For that is the love of God. the love of the Father that gives us. And we are one with you, God. So we thank you for being living vessels of your abundant good, of your life and your love. We thank you that we are your hands and feet. We thank you that we are the lock that gives to the key. That opens up that divine potential and overflowing blessings that's within each and every one of us. Yes. We give in the spirit of the Father. And we thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. And so it is. Somebody bigger than you and I 
it says that the Father and I are one, but the Father is greater. So even though we know our oneness and connection with the source, we have to realize that collectively we create something called a synergetic presence, which is bigger than the sum of all of its parts. So being together, even two or three, that's all it takes to create that something greater than, than the parts. So where two or three are gathered, I am in the midst, the I is the presence that's greater than each individual. So that's why coming together is such a wonderful experience. You grow faster when you're a part of, of a community of like-minded people, you'll grow faster because everything speeds up in that bigger than I part of it. So today, may we move uh, further along. All right, well, I thought I'd start with a little joke. We try to do that here because we can get heavy. So we would start out with a little maybe laugh. Maybe you'll laugh, maybe you won't, I don't know. This is about a pastor explained how Saturday was a day to get things done around the house because of work. Um, so anyway, yeah, <laughs> make sure I got the right one. You never know. Just a few weeks ago, he and his youngest son, Jeff, who is six years old, had just finished mowing the lawn, putting away things, and doing things that a father and a son would do. And Jeff, looking uh, at his son, says, what's going on with you, son? He says, Dad, why are we here? The great question we all ask at some point, isn't it? The pastor thought this would be a great teaching opportunity and he explained how we are the children of the Father in heaven, how he sent us here. He went through the whole spiritual theological explanation as to why we are here. And the father paused and asked if he had answered his question. The son responded, not really. The pastor then began to think, how else could I be able to answer this important question on why are we here? And the son says, Dad, why are we here? Were we supposed to pick up Mom an hour ago? <laughs> All right, this morning I'm going to present something maybe um, challenging to some of you. I don't know. But I come from a background of praise and worship was the emphasis of a service. Services were not built on just intellectualism. It wasn't built upon the intelligence of understanding and sometimes I think in new thought that can go that direction where we become too much into our head and our thinking and how smart we are and, and all of that. And that's fine. We need to grow in knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is important. But if we don't couple it with wisdom, knowledge doesn't do much good but to puff us up and to feed our ego. And there's even a scripture in Proverbs that says, and Knowledge shall make one weary. I know I get weary sometimes of all the books I think I should be reading and all the stuff that's coming in, my text and, and email and all the things that are available. We're just overloaded with this information age that we're in until you just want to shut down and I don't know which way to go. So be, beware of that and realize there's a timing in spirit as to how knowledge unfolds itself and don't become overwhelmed with that. But I don't find in, I looked all through the metaphysical dictionary of, based upon uh, Charles Fillmore, Merle Fillmore's teachings, which has become known as unity. And then I got out the science of mind, big thick book, and looked through homes and all of that. And I didn't find anywhere that directed me toward praise. And Coming from that, I know what praise can do. And I think sometimes we get a little confused or challenged by the idea of praising when we have been challenged about the definition of who and what a God is in the first place. Not seeing it as something separate from us as an old man in the sky. We really wonder exactly what are we praying to and what we are directing any praise or worship to. 
And that's why I think, Tom, your song was absolutely on target today because we need to realize there's something bigger than ourselves. Sometimes I don't know what to call it because it's so beyond my human ability to define it. My definition for me for God is an undefinable, non-local consciousness interacting with itself, and you are the itself that it is reacting with. It's relationship. Everything is energy. Everything is relationship. So it's all about the relationship. So I'm going to talk a little bit about praise. Not from a dogmatic Christian point of view necessarily, but from a more spiritual aspect or point of view. First, I'd like to just start with a story that was an experience. I try to start my messages now with experiences, not just knowledge. And I've told this before, but I'd like for you to indulge me. We're kind of early this morning, so give me a little time to, to do this. I don't have to be rushed. In 1978, I was pastoring a church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And some things happened as they happen in churches in which there was some issues that came up and and I was uh, sort of decided to set myself apart, but we were just ready to have this huge convention in which ministers were coming in from different parts of the country and had already been planned. So I decided to attend that, but not necessarily participate in it. So I was sitting more back uh, a ways and just observing all these different speakers were getting up and doing their thing and it just wasn't connecting with me, you know what I mean? It wasn't touching me where I was at that time. And therefore, I just kind of disconnected from what was going on around me. And I thought, well, I can't leave. They're going to think I'm mad. So i got to sit here through this whole thing. And those services were services that lasted a couple hours or more. They, they went on a long time in those days. So I thought, i got to sit here through this. And out of the boredom, this, this thought... This thought, let me say it this way, a thought happened to me that I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> have you ever had a thought that you know you would have never thought of that? Yes. That's called a penetration of higher self, bringing a thought into your human consciousness. It's called an epiphany, that aha moment that we hear about. And the thought came to me that I would have never thought about is, why don't you just use this time to go within and play a game. It's something to do. So I decided to play a game. And I thought, well, what game would I like to play? And all of a sudden, I thought, I want to play being God. And really, that was a challenging idea. I thought it might be easy, but I didn't really know what that would look like or that would be. So I was trying to figure out how could I play being God using my imagination? So what I came up with was the only thing that I knew was equal with God, and that's love. God is love. Not God has love. God is love. So I thought, okay, let's tap into imagining what it would be like to be the totality of all the love there is. Isn't that what God is? God is the totality of all. So I was trying to tap into this whole idea of being this all-loving being. And really, it somehow I tapped into more experiencing than I was imagining. And I began to feel like what it was to be the totality of love. And I just began to feel this, this rise in me, this presence that was saying, I'm the totality of all that love is. I am the all of love. And at first, it was kind of exciting to have that experience of feeling what it was like above, above a human love to have this sacred divine love. And then something changed in the whole scenario that was going on within me, and it didn't all of a sudden feel like you know, I was fulfilled to be all that love is. And I thought, what is going on? And I realized because being all love wasn't enough if you have nothing to love. So the all is not enough. 
So love wanted to move into loving. So it had to have a stimula to have the response. That's the law, stimula, response. So it created. And there was nothing to create because that which God is was the all. How can you go outside the all? That which has no beginning, no end, no birth, no death. How do you go beyond that? You can't. So there's nothing to create out of but that which is, exists. So God created out of itself, itself. It took out of itself, itself. And that really is the principle of the creator, father, and the son. Creating of itself. And I begin to experience this whole thing. It was almost like a memory was coming back to me of what it would be, would be like. In that, I understood for the first time, why are we here? <laughs> like the little boy, why are we here? Not on the level the little boy was asking, but why are we here? Why was there creation in the first place? If God is the all of the all, why did you need anything else? Because the all had not become all it was. That which is has to become what it is. Right? And that is the, that's the process. That's called the path, the process, the way. It is what you and I are doing right now. We, many of us know who we are, that we are created whole, divine, magnificent children of God, of the universe, but we have become that. What we've become is people of lack and need, needing prosperity, needing healing, needing a companion, needing a better house, needing a car. We're always trying to fill something, this innate hole in us, in our soul with something. So we look on the outside for people to become things. Instead of us becoming that which we are, we start drawing things to become, things to fulfill our lives. And it doesn't work. A house doesn't fulfill it. Even the most beautiful, your dream house, that car that you've always wanted, that Lexus, that, that Cadillac, that Mercedes, get it if you can, but it won't fulfill this yearning that I'm talking about, this, this dis, divine discontent that is in all of us, of the, 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 the divine self becoming. So we have to realize that things are fine to have, but they are not us becoming. It is not God as us becoming what it is. So we look for people who have love for us rather than us becoming the love that we are. This is what's stuck. This is why we are not living kingdom principle of peace and joy and righteousness and the Holy Spirit. It says it is not meat or drink, but it is peace and joy and righteousness. It's not things. Things will come. Things will come and things will go. That's what things do. But we're talking for that which is, that which is spiritual. So I begin to understand why there was a creation to love, for love to love. And you really can't love that which is lesser than you. That isn't love, that's pity. And you can't love that which is greater than you, that's admiration. You can only love that which is equal to you. Now bring that down into your relationships and tell a man and a woman or two people, whatever the orientation is, see each other as equals and love at an equal level, it's not love. It, and that's where it becomes dysfunctional. This is where it becomes dependency. This is where it becomes all of the trappings that we find ourselves in that we think we gotta get out of. And we think, oh, let's go find somebody else. And then we end up doing the same thing, playing the same drama out. Of course, the miracles put it this way, different form, same content. You can change a body and get another body, a person in a different body than the body you just had, and draw in 
at a level of vibration the same situation that you just got out of in a different form. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you've done it one or two times, three times, four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling psychic. <laughs> so this planted a seed in me that was very interesting to me. And then as a student of scripture and of Bible, I begin to read some scriptures I'd like to offer to you, Ezekiel 44. These are just scriptures that I don't take literally so much, but it, it provoked thought in me. I like to read anything. I don't care what it is. Any book, any text. Uh, any sacred text, doesn't matter what it is, but it prov provokes thought in me, then I like it. And this says in Ezekiel 44 and 16, and they entered into the, my sanctuary, and they said, God said to them, come to my table to minister unto me. And I've never had that thought that why would God need ministering to when God is God? We're the little peons that need everything from God. That's all we do is we spend our time with a prayer list like it's our list to Santa Claus. <laughs> this is what I need today, God. And we put ourselves always in receiving, receiving, receiving. Never realizing that that which we are receiving from would like to receive and be given to. You see that in the imbalance of any relationship. All giving, all receiving doesn't work. Both has to be a giver. Both has to be a receiver. There has to be a balance in you and in the, in the person in which you're in relationship with. And that's at any level. It doesn't matter what level it is. And I thought this is interesting that the God of Israel, of those people, was saying to those people, that it says did not go astray when everybody else did, but remain faithful over the holy things. He said, come to me and minister to me in the sacred place. What a new concept. Me having something for God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Think about most of your spiritual life. It's been get, 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 get. We get in trouble, we want God to get us out of it. If we need a job, we want God to give us a new job. All we've done is just come with our hand out to receive, to receive, to receive. Another scripture that at that time came to me was Psalms 115 and 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. Not unto me. As much as David needed and asked, there's a time in which David is saying, I'm not coming to you to receive what I get out of you, but what can I be for you today? When has there been a day and a morning that you got up and said, okay, I'm not going to ask you today for anything, but what could I be for you in the world? Can I be a conduit for your love to flow through me and as me everywhere I go today, to the grocery store, to the bank, all of the places that usually would frustrate me. Today, let me be the earthen vessel in which you pour your treasure out. Amen. If you need me to be an encouragement for somebody, because what I do to the least, I've done it unto you. So this was a whole new idea and concept that I began to shift, basically, my thinking. The real answer to put this together into a mental construct for me actually comes from the Kabbalistic point of view, the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah has answered many, many things for me. It's really one of the oldest teachings that are around and has been very advanced before its time. We're just now catching up with what the Kabbalist teaching is. But it goes and tells us that in the beginning all there was was this energy called the or, O-R, which is the word for light in Hebrew, light. And it goes on and tells us that at the essence, the Creator's nature was one of sharing. So creation was a being we call God creating itself and giving, giving life, giving light, 
giving all that it was to its creation. There's not a greater gift that any man or woman could receive but the attributes, the powers you call them in unity. They're called many things, the characteristics of all that God is placed in you, the holy seed of God, the DNA of God placed in you. It doesn't mean God is in you. It means the seed of God is in you, and the seed carries everything that it needs to bring forth fruit after its own kind. You get that? You can have a, a seed of wheat. It's not the wheat, but it has the DNA, and it knows how to produce after its kind. And that's what has been totally missed, as far as I'm concerned, in the whole spiritual community, is we've not allowed that which God is to produce itself, but we've produced a religion based on God. A man made perception and idea. So God creates this, it's called the vessel in the, in the Kabbalistic point of view. This vessel so he could pour himself into the vessel. Now the illustration here that was used is kind of simple but it's profound. Is that if you have a glass of uh, a glass and you pour hot water into it, the hot water will make the glass warm too. So there was no way that a creator could create a creature and not allow the creator, the creature, to also be that which created it. So that meant the, the giver and the receiver, the receiver had that ability to also be the giver. So we're created to give back to that which created us is what I'm saying. In simplicity but all we give it is our troubles our problems our needs our doubts don't know if I believe in you don't know what you are you're late yeah uh, all this bitching and moaning and carrying on that we do instead of just stopping be still and know and say today what can I be for you because as you begin to be the giver back you begin the, to understand the law that giving is also receiving, and you start receiving by being the giver. But as long as you make yourself only the receiver and God the giver, you're not completing the circle of giving and receiving. And I think what people need to give the most is what they need to receive. So if you're here and you need a healing or something, go out and talk to people. Go to the hospital. Go to a nursing home. Go to somebody you know that also is going through a, a disease or a physical challenge and give encouragement and give love. But you're saying, I need that. I need somebody come and help me out. I need a healer. No, you're going to find out that you are the healer by being the healing. It's universal divine law that, that tells us that. So the vessel receiving wants to share. It wants to share. The primordial vessel embodied an entirely new energy, the energy of receiving. The Kabbalists maintained that the appearance of the vessel was only out of the only thing that existed called the Inhof, or what we call the invisible spirit without beginning and without end. The creation of the vessel was by no means the end, however. It was not even the beginning or the beginning of the beginning. A discussion process started and one of those continuations was implied by a fundamental duality of the vessel's nature. Sharing energy, receiving energy. What could it give? The only thing that it could give is gratitude and appreciation to that which had created it. That is called praise or worship. Now I know in New Thought we don't see it quite 
exactly the way that we, uh, that others see God out there who wants our praise. And I used to sit in churches back in the day that I believed, or tried to believe in those things, and I thought, well, I'll give you an example. We used to sing a song called, Oh, lift him up, lift Jesus up, let it be from eternity. And I'm thinking, why does Jesus need lift up? <laughs> He'd already been lifted up. I need lifting up. But what I found was that as I sang that song, I was lifting myself up. I came in there discouraged, kind of down, and all of a sudden, began to pat my foot a little bit, and I began to sing that song, and I began in the rhythm of it, and all of a sudden, I realized I had changed my whole vibration by music and sound, and that I, lifting Jesus up, who didn't need to be lifted up, lifted myself up, and I began to feel the presence of that which I call Jesus because we had a matching frequency at that time. That's why the music and the singing, we don't need to do that because that's a thing you do when you come to the church. When you come to church, you don't have to sing and have, we do this for a reason. This is a part of the spiritual experience. It's for you to have an opportunity to change your vibration through sound and vibration and frequency. Praise. So, I wanted to read something to you, although I don't see it. Okay. I did not get in my notes somehow, I think. Anyway, I can tell you. <laughs> it is a Course of Miracles gave me the real answer to this. And it says something like, this. oh, it's up here. There you go. This is what supposedly Jesus saying. I do not need gratitude, but you need to develop your weakened ability to be grateful. Wow, that is so powerful to me. Or you cannot appreciate God. He doesn't need your appreciation, but you do. I went, my goodness, that's it. When I was singing, lift Jesus up. I needed to sing it because it was lifting me up, not Jesus. What I do in the form of worship and praise is going to change my relationship. Now I'm in relationship. A relationship is not one-sided. It's got to be both giving and receiving. People have got to be complementary to one another. You can be different in areas. There's stronger areas. There's weaker areas between uh, a couple. But they've got to be complementary to each other. Tim and I are a great um, testimony to that of 28 years. I know his strengths. He knows my strengths. We know each other's weakness. And we complement each other where we can. And that gives us a successful relationship. The scripture is very clear to say that God inhabits the praise of the people. So Psalms 23 and 3. Whew, I'm changing my vibration right here. <laughs> Just talking about it. I have seen manifestations in the form of healings and wonderful things happen <coughs> during the time of praise. Because God inhabited those praises and brought forth manifestation. God's not withholding anything from you today. He's not withholding that healing. He's not a hold, a holding back that prosperity or what it is that you desire to see manifested in your life. It's not that it's being withheld from you. It's that you're not giving God an environment in which to manifest himself or herself as that answer for you or desire. So maybe if we stop complaining that God hadn't answered our prayers or we've not manifested with all the affirmations we've done and start into a place of just gratitude and praising God for being God, that we would change the atmosphere of our inner consciousness 
to become not just a receiver and then a giver, but a very giver that's a receiver. How is your relationship with your deity, whatever you choose to call it, source, God, mother, father, I don't care. Those are just terms that we pick out. But what is your relationship right now? Just check in where you are with your life. How are you feeling when you do your prayer, when you do your meditations, whatever you do outside of these services that you do on a spiritual level? What's going on? Do you have a good, healthy relationship? Or deep down, the Course of Miracles says, and this is pretty heavy psych psychological ideas, but it says at some level, psych subconsciously, we all hate God for God not being what we want God to be. <laughs> now that's heavy duty stuff, but that's where your healing has to start is in your subconscious. Because conscience goes, oh no, I don't believe that. I wouldn't even think such a thing. No. Because you, you're taught you better not think that kind of thing. God will lower the hammer on you. <laughs> I used to praise God because I was afraid not to praise God. Mm -hmm. When I was in the fundamentalist church, if I didn't praise God and I didn't straighten up and do right, I was going to go to hell. So I'm going, I'm going to do it. Then when I got free from all that teaching, I realized that now what I extend, I do out of gratitude and free will back to the creator. What a different feeling and experience that was to not have to do it out of fear, but to do it because I had first time totally experienced love. So let us all this morning take from this the idea that the Father and I are one. And he says, there's those of you who don't know how to worship, but he says there's those of you who will learn to worship my Father in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit means that you're worshiping from the place of the spirit within you where it's already done. And if you come from the place that it's already done, you're going to feel gratitude even if you don't see it done. It's easy. It's easy to praise when it's done, when that check comes in you didn't expect or you, you, you have something happen that is uh, fulfilling a desire that you had. Man, it's easy. But can you give in the time in which the appearance is different? In an atmosphere in which it has not happened at this outer dimension, that is called faith. Faith is the true inner sight of all of us to see things differently than they appear to be. So let's check from this Sunday our relationship with God this week. Our thoughts, our prayers. We don't have to go into a prayer mode to pray. But our thoughts, when they are things of spirit and God, how are those thoughts? Do they come from gratitude or from a deep belief of lack or questioning? Let's develop our relationship, a more intimate relationship with the divine and with the creator. And I think that will change everything in your life if you change your relationship with the creator. Praise. Praise. Jesus did not really ask for our praise. He just says you need to do it. Because praise puts you into the place that you need to be of who you truly are. So it's not that we have some needy God out there who needs to be built up every day. But it is how we raise our experience and our relationship with our Creator. Let us pray. Let's take a deep breath. We thank you today for this ability to check in with our relationship with you today. As we review a little bit of our prayers in this last few days, let's say, 
Has it always been, give me, give me, only the receiver? What have you given? Have you given back gratitude, faith, honor, praise? So my body is sick. My body is in pain, which it has been this week in some areas. Now I can say, God, I have a need and I want you to meet it. Or I can say, thank you, God, that you didn't create my body this way. You created my spiritual body whole and perfect in this moment. Thank you, God, that even though that body has not manifested out here in the physical, I know it's coming. Thank you, God. I know your work is complete and perfect. I celebrate creation. Today, I say thank you, God, from a place in which I've never said it before, but from the depths of the sacredness of my own heart. I choose not to look at circumstances or appearance of lack or need. But this week, I'm going to dedicate every day to what can I be for you today? Not unto us, O oh Lord, but unto thy name do we give glory. Use me. I'm your availability in this dimension. As we heard in the meditation, so beautiful. We are your hands, your feet, your eyes. So let's just praise God in your own way, however you do it. Just give praise from your heart to God today. Cut right through the doubts and the limitations and the boundaries that you believe or think is in your life. Break through those barriers, those walls that we broke down last Sunday. They're not there anymore. Just walk right through them. <laughs> go to that place of praise and gratitude.